Hello everyone, welcome to the third lecture in topics in locally conformal molecular geometry. So last time we studied some uh, explicit examples of uh, LCK metrics, and we said that we will uh, try to understand which ones are of Weissmann type and uh, which aren't. So I remind you, I will start with the definition that uh, we gave last time that an LCK metric omega is Weissmann if its leaf form is parallel with respect to the metric itself. So if the leaf form theta satisfies nabla g of theta equals zero. And we exclude the case when theta is identically zero, which would be the Keller case. So the first remark is that uh, theta has constant length. So, and is nowhere, nowhere vanishing actually. So if theta is parallel, it means that in every point is different from zero or any point of the manifold M. Okay, because since theta is parallel, the norm has to be constant. Since we excluded the case uh, of uh, theta being zero, theta has to have some positive length and therefore theta is nowhere zero. Okay, detecting um, in, in detecting if the LCK structure is Weismann or not, the following theorem that we shall prove in the course it will turn out to be very useful. So this theorem is due to Leon Lopez Marrero and Padron. Maybe this accent is the other way around. So in uh, 99, uh, stating the following thing about uh, the morse novikov cohomology with respect to a parallel uh, form. So this is the, most, the more general context. If M is a compact manifold and theta is a real closed one form such that theta is parallel with respect to a metric G, then the morse novikov cohomology of M with respect to theta vanishes. So I remind you uh, briefly what the morse novikov cohomology was. It was the cohomology produced by the twisted operator D theta. So if you remember, if we had a closed one form theta, then we had an operator increasing the degree of uh, the form by one given by D minus theta wedge. And as a consequence of theta being closed, d theta squared equals zero and therefore uh, produces a cohomology. These cohomology groups are by definition kernel of d theta quotient by the image of d theta. And uh, uh, there are some, they are cohomology groups for M, but they say more about theta than about the, the manifold. The small remark is that if theta is globally exact, so is the differential of a globally defined uh, smooth function f, then the morse novikov cohomology of this global one form is just the usual Durham cohomology. One can check that this is actually the isomorphism. It's given by 
the class of some Cohen form goes to the class of the exponential minus f times the form alpha. Okay, so we shall prove this theorem. Because in particular, it tells us that if we have a compact manifold which admits a Weismann metric, then the morse novikov cohomology with respect to the Lie form of the Weismann metric vanishes. So in uh, since the Weismann form omega is d theta closed, in particular, it has to be d theta exact. This is how this theorem will be useful for us. So let's start the proof. So the, the key will be to use a twisted version of the Hodge decomposition that we know uh, for the exterior derivative operator. So the key is to use a twisted version of the Hodge decomposition. I remind you that by Hodge decomposition, I on compact manifolds, I mean this equality that K forms split as the direct sum of harmonic forms of degree K plus exact forms plus co-exact forms. So this delta here is the adjoint of D with respect to a Riemannian metric G. Okay, we would like to use a twisted version of this decomposition in the sense that uh, we would like to replace D with D theta and delta with the adjoint of D theta. For this, we need to, to understand what the adjoint of d theta is. It's not difficult to uh, compute it in practice. So I will tell you explicitly what the adjoint is. First, we have to take the metric dual of the form And then we can easily check that the adjoint of d theta is the following operator denoted by delta theta, which is delta the adjoint of d plus the interior uh, product with respect to the metric dual. So this is the adjoint of d theta. <clears throat> of course, whenever I say a joint is with respect to the scalar product, to the L2 scalar product. Which we can denote in by brackets. So two forms, the scalar, pro the scalar product of two forms alpha and beta is the integral of alpha which star beta. And therefore, since delta theta is the adjoint of d theta, d theta alpha scalar product with beta is the scalar product between alpha and delta theta of beta. Okay, this means that we can define a twisted Laplacian operator uh, delta theta, capital delta, to be d theta delta theta plus delta theta d theta. Of course, one recuperates the usual definitions when theta equals to zero. And it's an easy exercise that we obtain the same orthogonal decomposition. So we obtain an orthogonal decomposition of uh, K forms in the same way. So K forms split as twisted harmonic forms 
plus d theta exact forms plus co-exact forms with respect to d theta. Okay, so by twisted harmonic, what do we mean? We mean exactly those forms that are co-closed and closed with respect to d theta. So just as in the usual uh, context that we are used to. Okay, and again, by mimicking the case that we know uh, for compact uh, manifolds, we obtain that the Morse-Novikov cohomology groups are actually given by twisted harmonic forms. Okay, and this will be the, the key uh, factor to use in the proof. Now, another small thing is that, uh, of course, without loss of generality, we can assume that the norm of theta equals one. So that theta applied to the vector field, which is the metric dual of theta equals one. This is always done by a rescaling if necessary. Okay, what we should heavily use is that since theta is parallel, then theta, well, seen as the vector field, the metric dual is a killing vector field. So by killing a vector field, I mean that it preserves the metric G. So why, why is that? Well, this is, um, this is an easy computation. So if we have a small parenthesis here. We just have to check that the lead derivative of the metric G along the vector field uh, theta sharp applied to two vector fields x and y is and here at some point we have to use the fact that it is parallel so now we just write down the definition for this we use the fact that the lead derivative of a vector field is given by the D bracket. And now we use the properties, the usual properties of the levi civita connection. And finally, that theta is parallel. So actually these terms don't exist. I mean, they, they vanish. So therefore, the, what, what uh, is left is exactly the levi civita connection applied to G along theta sharp calculated in X and Y, but this is just the property of the levi connection that it preserves G. So therefore, theta sharp is a killing vector field. 
Okay, this can help us to prove, but I won't give all the details of because they are somehow a play with the definitions. They are easy to, to prove. The lead derivative with respect to the metric dual of theta can be computed as minus delta composed with the operator e theta. I will explain what this operator is in a moment, minus e theta composed with delta. So this is using the fact that theta sharp is killing. And this operator is just the wedge with, uh, with theta. Okay, so we are ready at this point to perform some computation tricks. We look at the lead derivative of theta sharp of any form alpha, any k form alpha. So maybe I should say here, let alpha be now a k form. And we want to compute this L2 product of the lead derivative of alpha along theta sharp and alpha. So according to, uh, according to the identity here, so maybe I should name it somehow relation star. This is minus delta of theta wedge alpha minus theta wedge delta of alpha alpha. Okay, but now using, using the adjointness and the fact that we can always balance the operators with their adjoints on the other side, this is minus theta wedge alpha d alpha. Right, we move delta to the other side and it became d minus theta wedge delta alpha. No, minus delta alpha. Sorry. And the interior product of alpha with respect to theta sharp. So this is because we balanced, uh, uh, this is because uh, wedging with theta, this operator has as a joint the interior product with the metric dual. Okay, and furthermore, it means that this is minus alpha interior product of theta sharp and the alpha plus the interior product of theta sharp and alpha. Okay, this is nice because here we regain the Cartan formula. So this is exactly the lead derivative of alpha along theta sharp. So we get from this small computation that the L2 product of the lead derivative of alpha along theta sharp and alpha vanishes for any k form alpha. Okay, since we want to show that um, the Morse Novikov cohomology vanishes, and we had just seen that the Morse Novikov cohomology groups are given by the uh, harmonic, twisted harmonic forms. Our goal will be to show that there are no twisted harmonic forms. So if we take now alpha, a twisted harmonic form, we would like to show that this is zero and therefore we finish the proof. Okay, again, just by using, uh, just by playing with definitions, using the harmonicity, using the lead derivative, formula, the lead derivative of alpha along theta sharp turns out to be, so I'm hiding here under the rug some computations, will be minus alpha plus d theta applied to the interior product 
of alpha with theta sharp. So this would be the uh, uh, twisted Hodge decomposition of this K form because alpha is twisted harmonic and this is a d theta exact form. So this is the twisted uh, ver twisted decomposition of uh, of this form here. Okay, but now again, one can prove that the, der the lead derivative of theta sharp with a long theta sharp commutes with both d theta and delta theta. So from here, we deduce an important fact that if alpha is uh, twisted harmonic, then the lead derivative of alpha with respect to theta sharp is twisted harmonic because it is d theta closed and co-closed. So if alpha is twisted harmonic, then the lead derivative of alpha with respect to theta sharp is twisted harmonic. Okay, and therefore, since this is twisted harmonic, it's twisted Hodge decomposition has to be just the harmonic part, just this part here. So we get that the lead derivative of alpha has to be minus alpha. But, uh, from this equality here, we get that the L2 product, the L2 norm of alpha vanishes, and therefore alpha is zero in this finishes the proof. It means that there are no twisted harmonic forms, and therefore the twisted cohomology groups uh, vanish the morris novikov cohomology vanishes. Okay, so as I said, in particular, this tells us that if omega is Weismann, then omega has a d theta primitive, is d theta of some one form eta. So this was because Weismann is already an LCK metric. So LCK meant d theta closedness. So since omega is d theta closed. Okay, so now we have a good uh, criteria, a good uh, tool maybe to at least to uh, tell if some LCK matrix can be of Weismann type or not. And we actually will use this tool for Inoue and Kato surfaces. So remember that last time we, we put some LCK matrix on Inoue and Kato surfaces. We will, we will prove that Inoue surfaces and Kato surfaces don't bear at all Weismann matrix. There exists no Weismann metrics because we shall prove something more um, powerful. There exists no L LCK metrics that are d theta exact. So this is actually a stronger statement. So actually, there exists. no LCK metrics that are d theta exact. And by d theta exact, I mean that they are d theta of some one form eta. 
Okay, the techniques are a bit different for uh, Inue and Kato. That's why I chose uh, precisely them to show this. So for Inue surfaces, it is easy to show in a computational fashion. So in wet surfaces, I remind you that they were of three types, SM, S plus, and PQRT, and SN, S minus and PQR. <clears throat> the approach is more computational, like purely computational, I would say, uh, because all these three, bear a salt manifold structure. So they are a quotient of a solvable group to a discrete co-compact group, subgroup gamma. And things get uh, nice here because their first Betty number is one. And their first Doram cohomology group is generated by a closed one form, which is the, the one form that was the Lie metric of the LCK metric given by Tricheri. And this is, so let's say that this is the Lie form of the LCK metric given by Tricheri. And its number one quality is that is left invariant. So it comes from an object on G, it comes from a, a closed one form on G that it is left in, invariant. So invariant to left multiplications with elements in uh, the Lie group G. Okay. The uh, practical part of this is that we can perform the following trick. So this trick was given by Belgun in 2000. So since this theta zero is left invariant and it, it is the generator of H1, in all the cases, uh, yeah, of course, uh, when I, I, I say here about the inverse surfaces and the LCK metrics, I talk only about those who admit LCK metrics. So when the parameter T is real. Okay, so that was small parenthesis. So since theta zero is left invariant and is the generator of uh, H1, any LCK metric on these inverse surfaces can be averaged to a left invariant one. So to an LCK metric, which is left invariant with respect to the multiplication to the left multiplication on G. Why? Because one can always define, one can always start with any LCK metric, omega. And the averaging procedure is just means that, or the mediation procedure just means that we define this omega zero in two left invariant vector fields x and y to be the integral of omega applied to x and y. So this is a function times a B invariant volume form. The integral is over the manifold itself. So this is for any X and Y left invariant vector fields. This um, B invariant volume form exists. Omega zero thus defined is can be easily shown to be left invariant.
and LCK. With a left invariant uh, leaf form, since anyway, the leaf forms are uh, ha have to be in the com in the same cohomology class with um, a co multiple of theta zero. So maybe I hid under the rug something: the fact that this omega here. So we start with any LCK metric that has the leaf form already a multiple of theta zero. So this theta this uh, omega has the property that the omega is some c times theta zero wedge omega. Because if its leaf form is not uh, invariant, so it's not precisely theta zero or a multiple of it, it is anyway cohomologous to a multiple of theta zero. And then we can take in the conformal class of that LCK metric, the LCK metric, which has the leaf form precisely C times theta zero. Okay, good. This tells us that we, if we have a LCK matrix, then we have left invariant ones. And using now the structure equations of the Lie algebra, the Lie algebra of the Lie group, which is in the description as solved manifolds of the inverse surfaces, by computation, purely computation on the Lie algebra, so linear on the, it's just linear algebra arguments, uh, one can show that no left invariant metric of type d theta eta can exist. Therefore, no Weismann. So averaging a, a metric that is d theta exact will preserve the d theta is exactness. So that's why after all, it's a matter only of studying left invariant metrics and only studying uh, the compatibility with the structure equations of the Lie algebra G. So no Weismann for in West surfaces. For Cato surfaces, the argument is slightly more elegant. So again, we have the same result that no LCK matrix that are d theta exact can exist on a cutter surface. The proof, the proof uses the fact that uh, in a genuine cutter surface, so one that is not a primary hope surface, we have uh, an immersion of CP1. So if it's not a primary hope surface, but I remind you, it was obtained by just by taking the disk taking a contraction of the disk, removing the uh, image of this disk and gluing the two boundaries here. This was a primary Hopf manifold. So gluing um, gluing these two boundaries along the contraction. But a genuine cut surface, meant that we perform some blow-ups above the origin. And of course, when we blow up points, uh, we are in complex dimension two, the exceptional divisors are just uh, copies of CP1. So then there exists an immersion J 
of CP1 in our surface. Because at least one blow up is performed in pi. So pi was the sequence of blow ups. I mean that pi consists at least of one blow up. Uh, this immersion is not necessarily injective. So it might happen that if we perform only one blow up, then the resulting cathode surface will have a CP1, which will auto intersect, which will look uh, like this. So anyway, we just need an immersion of CP1 in S, not necessarily uh, injective. And now we can argue that if there existed a d theta exact LCK form, LCK metric omega. So this omega would be d theta of some one form eta. Then when we look at this, uh, the Lee form, but only on the exceptional divisor, on this uh, CP1 immersed in uh, our cathode surface S, so the pullback of theta on CP1, this has to be uh, globally exact since uh, CP1 is simply connected. So F is just a smooth function on CP1. But then it means that the Keller metric obtained by pulling back the LCK metric uh, omega on CP1 and multiplying it with this positive uh, factor, the exponential of minus F. So this is a Keller metric on CP1. Would be globally exact. Satisfies that it is So I would write here all the steps. And here, just by uh, manipulating a little bit of the terms is the exterior derivative of this one form. But by Stokes, of course, it cannot exist an exact uh, Keller form, right? Because on one hand, Integrating this form on CP1 has to be positive as a volume form. And on the other hand, since it is exact, it has to vanish by Stokes. So we get a contradiction. Therefore, there exists no d theta exact LCK matrix on cathode surfaces. And this uh, uh, this uh, closes the door for Weismann. So no Weismann for Kato. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the other. Uh, the other pole, we have properly elliptic surfaces. We have Kodaira surfaces that can be shown to admit Weismann matrix. And it can be done by hand, the fact that the Lie metric of the LCK metric given by Belboon is parallel. Okay, so now we have we have LCK metrics that are interesting, and we have a very interesting class 
which is given by Weissman matrix. Uh, a natural question. that was uh, posed um, yeah, throughout the whole study of LCK geometry is if there is any topological restriction for the existence of an LCK metric or for the existence of a Weissmann metric. Any topological restriction in the sense that maybe an, an abstraction that mimics the Keller case. For the Keller case, we have some uh, uh, obvious abstractions on Betty numbers, for example. So is there any topological restriction for the existence of LCK? But maybe there exists something for this uh, uh, rigid subclass, which is represented by Weissmann matrix. On compact manifolds, of course, the compactness is important. I mean, as you already know, in the Keller case, the most famous restriction on uh, the cohomology in the compact case is that uh, the even indexed Betty numbers are not zero and the odd indexed Betty numbers are even. So could we hope for something similar for LCK, compact LCK manifolds? And it was a conjecture in the eighties due to Weissmann that stated that a compact LCK manifold whose Betty numbers obey this uh, restriction just as for the Keller case. So obeying the fact that uh, the even index Betty numbers are not vanishing and the odd index Betty numbers are divisible by two. Admits a Keller metric. So is actually globally conformally Keller. This was the conjecture. But this conjecture was disproven by a very interesting class of LCK uh, manifolds that ar uh, arise from number theory. So this was disproven by a class of manifolds that generalize in newer surfaces. And I will present uh, in a moment. In newer surfaces of type uh, SM. Okay, and these manifolds are called early Klaus Thoma manifolds. They were introduced by uh, early Klaus and Thoma in 2005. And the foundation for the construction of this manifold is uh, number theory. So they arise from a number theoretical background. So they are quotients, compact quotients of products of HS cross CT, where H, just as in the last lecture, was given by the Poincare half plane. So those complex numbers whose imaginary part is positive. So of course you can see that they are uh, they generalize they have to generalize in a way because in way surfaces for compact quotients of h uh, times c. 
now let's see how exactly how they are defined. So the definition requires um, something called the number field in number theory. So this is a finite extension of Q, of the field of rational numbers. So K is usually known in number theoretical terminology as number field. Since it's finite, the degree of this extension can denote it by N. And this number field has some real embeddings that some S, let's say S real embeddings. And some complex embeddings that come uh, in, in pairs, they are conjugated. So S real embeddings and 2T complex embeddings. This S uh, and T satisfy uh, this equality. So the number of embeddings is the number, uh, is the degree of the extension. Okay, so uh, essentially you have to think of this K as Q of some algebraic number alpha. And um, for the embeddings, you have to think that so sigma i defined on k with values in c will just, is defined uh, on the value, is defined only in alpha. So if we know where alpha goes, we know everything. So these embeddings will move alpha to its conjugates. or to the other roots of the minimal polynomial of alpha. So uh, let's say the first embedding will be just the identity. We'll send the uh, alpha in alpha and therefore we'll send K in, uh, in K. And then depending on the nature of the conjugates, so of course some of the conjugates will be real, some of the conjugates will be complex. This will decide the nature of the embedding. Uh, okay. So from now on, we will assume that S and T are at least one. From now on, both S and T are uh, greater or equal to one. And note that for any S and T, there exists a number field with precisely S real embeddings and 2T uh, complex embeddings. So for any S and T, there exists a number field with precisely S real embeddings and 2T complex embeddings. Okay, we're not done with the number theory because we still have to build the compact portion of HS cross CT, where now we recognize who S and T is. And we need the main characters will be this, uh, will be some objects that are very known in number theory. The first one is the ring of algebraic integers. So let's denote by this ring, uh, let's denote this ring with OK calligraphical in K, the ring of algebraic integers. And let's take the map that sends an integer to all the embeddings. But by all the embeddings, I mean all the real embeddings and half of 
the complex embeddings, the one that will determine the other half. So sigma of A to be sigma 1 of A, sigma S of A. So these first S are the real embeddings, sigma S plus 1 of A, sigma S plus T of A. Okay, in some uh, uh, classical result from number theory states that the image of this sigma is a maximal lattice in RS cross CP. So it is a, a lattice of maximal rank, which is so the maximal rank is S plus two times T, which is N. And we can act with this ring of integers on HS cross CT by, uh, by translations. So we can, sorry, we can add, uh, we can act with A on HS cross CT. in the following fashion. So A acts on W1, WS, Z1, CT. So the Ws are the coordinates on H, the Zs are the coordinates on C, just by adding the corresponding embedding. In doing so, if we take now the quotient of HS cross CT to this action, uh, what we will have what we will have done? So we noticed that on the first S component, it will act only on the real part of H because it's just by adding the real numbers. So the imaginary parts of the coordinates on HS are completely unaffected. So this means that this quotient will leave R plus S, which comes from the imaginary parts of HS. Uh, it will leave them alone and will act on the real parts and on CT, but will compactify this part so it will be a torus because OK is a lattice of rank N. OK, this is a complex manifold, but it's not compact. We can, we can think how to compactify this part, R plus S. And for this, we need the other main uh, character of display, which is the group of positive units. which is the group of those units whose real embeddings are positive. And we can act with this group on the quotient we produced so far, but um, yeah, we can act uh, in a compatible way. But this action won't have good properties, it won't create a compact quotient. So we can act now by dilation, by dilations, by multiplying each component with uh, the corresponding embedding. Still, this group is too big and the action won't be properly discontinuous. And we have to restrict to a smaller group. Okay. 
And for this, we need to perform the following trick. So we will take the so-called logarithmic representation of the group of positive units, which simply takes the logarithm of the embeddings. So we are entitled to do this because the first real, uh, the, the real embeddings are positive. And then we take the logarithm of the absolute value. The image of this logarithmic representation will land in a hyper hyperplane. This uh, in a hyperplane given by the following uh, uh, equation is the sum of all the components is zero. So this is simply because you being a unit, um, the product of all the embeddings is one. And therefore, the sum of the logarithms is zero. So here we take the product of all the embeddings. Because this is one, the logarithm is zero. Okay, another result, result from number theory that we should just use as a, as a fact is that uh, this image of the logarithmic representation is a maximal lattice in H. So has rank S plus T minus one. So I said that we need a smaller, a smaller group of positive units. That smaller group will be taken in such a way that the projection on the first S components of the logarithmic representation is a lattice of maximal rank S. So S plus T minus one is at least S because both S and T are uh, at least one, greater or equal than one. And therefore we will act only with this U on the non-compact portion. We will take now the portion. This will be a good action. This will be properly discontinuous. And what we will have done is like acting on HS cross CT with the semi-direct product between U and OK. And this is the so-called OTO early class Thomas manifold associated to K and U. So K and U were uh, the ingredients. Okay, this is a compact manifold and it is complex because we acted only by, uh, by holomorphisms. So uh, these were just uh, affine transformations and therefore it inherits a complex structure from HS cross CT. And in complex dimension two, so when S and T are equal to one, we regain the new S surfaces of type uh, SM. Okay, these manifolds were the ones who disproved, which disproved the uh, conjecture of uh, Weissmann. And a couple of facts to understand why. So a couple of interesting facts are the following, that these manifolds are part of a real vibration with the base torus and the fiber torus, a real torus. Their first Betty number is equal to S, the number of real embeddings. And they are not of Keller type. So 
So one can see this because one can compute H01 dolbo to be S and H10 dolbo to be zero. So therefore no uh, Hodge symmetry here. So therefore no Keller metric. And the early Klaus and Toma proved that the LCK admitting an LCK metric can be translated into a number theoretical uh, result, into a number theoretical condition uh, that they should satisfy. So X admits an LCK metric. If and only if the complex embeddings have the same uh, absolute value for any positive unit uh, u in uh, u. So this condition is automatically satisfied when t equals 1. because there's nothing to prove, uh, there is nothing to, to verify. So therefore, uh, the OT manifolds of type S1, so when t equals one, are LCK, admit LCK metrics. Still no known examples of OT manifolds of type ST with T different from one are known. So this is still an, an open problem. And um, <clears throat> just as their, uh, uh, just as their children, the NUE surfaces, they carry a solved manifold structure. So they can be organized as quotients of a solvable E group to a discrete co compact uh, group gamma. This is, was done by Kasuya. And in the same computational fashion, one can prove, so using the description, the explicit description of the Lie algebra of G, uh, one can prove that uh, X does not admit, the ones who admit LCK metric cannot admit LCK metrics that are D theta exact. So D theta of some one form eta. Okay, the manifolds that is proved Weismann's conjecture were very simple, were in the case S equals two, T equals one. So an OT threefold, so complex dimension three. Because here we can explicitly compute the Betty numbers. So we have uh, Betty zero, Betty one equals to two, Betty two equals one, Betty three is zero, Betty four is one. And now, anyway, we have Poincare uh, duality. So these are the Betty numbers and they are exactly as Weismann asked them to be, but uh, X does not admit uh, Keller metrics. X is LCK but not Keller. Okay, so in the next lecture, we shall prove that actually there are some interesting homological restrictions that the Weismann manifold, compact Weismann manifold has to obey. In general for LCK, not much is known, but I will give you a little spoiler for next lecture. So what is known in the general case for LCK or just a mild homological restriction. Logical restrictions.
more compact LCK that are not, uh, of course, uh, globally conformally color or um, calarian. So that when whenever I will say LCK, I will mean the genuine case when the structure is not uh, globally conformally color. And these are, uh, as we shall see, but actually we kind of proved it, is that the one one uh, both churn homology group cannot be zero. And that the first Betty number is strictly less than two times the zero one Hodge number. And of course, Betty number is not zero. So this is the our uh, frame of work because uh, if Betty one is zero, then any closed one form is globally exact and uh, any LCK metric would be automatically globally conformally color metric, which is anyway the case that we want to exclude. So uh, this is it for, for today. And we shall see exactly the Weismann case for next lecture.